I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 is our text. And if you are in the room, either here or Parker campus, and you don't have a Bible, then go ahead and grab one. If you're at Sweetwater, they're in the seats around you. If you're at our Parker campus, then they're at a table in the back. Just get up and go grab you a Bible and turn to page 1025. Page 1025 is where you will find Luke chapter 6. You'll be able to follow along in the Bible with us. And if you uh, don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because you know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, we want you to have one as well. So please message us, either uh, our online host or email us at the church office, and we would love to get you a Bible, whether we hand deliver it or whether we mail it to you. We want everyone to be changed by the power of God's Word. Hey, uh, before I dive into the message that uh, we're going to talk about in Luke 6, uh, can I just uh, invite all of you to go to the Holy Land with me? I, I mean, I'd love to do that. I mean, I, I, I'm mentioning this because we're about 60 days away from the, the deadline to sign up and pay. And if that's on your bucket list and you've been, you've been kind of thinking, should I, shouldn't I, should I, or shouldn't I? You should. Okay? I'm just, I'm just saying. We've uh, we got a good group going, about 30 people right now signed up. And, uh, and if you want to be included in that, then uh, grab the information that's out at the, on the wall outside in the lobby and, and uh, fill out that paperwork, turn it in, and go and experience uh, the Bible like never before. Because it comes alive as you walk where Jesus walked, as you see the places that you've been reading about for a lifetime. Uh, just an opportunity, and I wanted to mention that because we're heading into summer and everything gets so busy and we forget about the things that are out in the future, and that's coming up in October, and I would love to take you with me. So that's my invitation to you. Hey, uh, 30 years ago this weekend, I started serving as pastor of Calvary, and, uh, and I never dreamed that God would allow me to serve in this incredible ministry for this long. Truthfully, I never planned on staying this long. I mean, you know, look, I was young. You guys, I don't know if you realize this. Calvary's the only church I've ever been the pastor of. And, uh, and I always can just consider that because nobody else wants me. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but I came here uh, young and inexperienced. And I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll stay at Calvary for three or four years. And then I'll move to a real church in a real city. And, and I share that because I just want you to know God's plans are always better than our plans. Always. And, and I thank God that he didn't listen to me through the years, especially when I was, you know, praying things like, get me out of here. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I'm just thankful. I'm grateful to God for allowing me to serve him here at Calvary. So um, 30 years. Uh, and by the way, I'm not really a fan of the whole yay Chad stuff. Uh, but these... <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Uh, but, uh, see, here's the thing. Uh, every time we have one of these anniversaries, people ask the same question. And that is, well, you've been here 30 years, so, uh, you know, are you going to move? Are you going to relocate? Or are you going to, you know, go someplace else? And I just want to answer that so that you can hear it really clearly. Uh, I'm not leaving. Okay? So... This is my prayer, and this is my statement. God willing, because it's always up to him, because, you know, he owns us, right? So God willing, I'm going to retire, die, or be raptured as pastor of Calvary. Okay? So, just, just saying. But uh, let's, let's put that to rest. So if somebody says, wow, he's going he's to leave now, then uh, just smack him. And uh, then give him an ice cream sandwich, which I hope you enjoy. Uh, now, by the way, if you're new to Calvary and you're like, uh, okay, so what's the plan? Because you aren't a spring chicken anymore. Uh, I, I, can, I can accept that. I, I, know, I know how old I look and I know how old I am. So my plan is, if God allows me to live that long and be healthy, I'm going to retire in 10 years at 70. Uh, but in five years, I'm planning on stepping from the lead pastor role into a uh, teaching pastor role and, and serve in that capacity uh, because as you get older, uh, you shouldn't necessarily carry that load uh, with you. So that's, that's my plan. But let me just tell you this. We've spent way too much time talking about my life. Let's talk about your life, shall we? So I want to share with you how to build your life. 
How to build your life. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 46 to 49 is our text. And, and here's the thing. If I were going to pick, which I did not pick this text for this weekend. It, it was just part of our sermon plan. We plan our sermons out a year in advance. Uh, and this was the one on this weekend. And, but I would have picked it if uh, I had been saying, hey, let me pick one of my favorite texts to share. So uh, this is just God's timing. And, and I want you to hear this. Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Um, Jesus asks a very challenging question. The question is this. You heard it. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord and ignore me? I mean, I, in my mind, I picture Jesus kind of face palming right after he says this. You know, like, or just kind of going, hey, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Duh. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and yet it's, a, it's an incredibly challenging question because he's asking us really simple. Now, by the way, he's talking to his apostles. He's talking to the crowds that had gathered to listen to him. And Jesus is talking to us. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Jesus is talking to you. That means he's talking to me and you. Why do you, why do we call him Lord and not do what he says? In other words, if you're going to identify Jesus as Lord of your life, why wouldn't you obey him? Is it because you don't understand the concept of Lord? That means master, boss, king, the one who owns you, the one who directs you, the one who tells you what to do? Is it it because you didn't understand that when you stepped into the relationship and said, I want to serve Jesus, I want to follow Jesus? It's kind of implied in that whole following thing, isn't it? Because if you're playing follow the leader, somebody's the leader and it's not you. It's Jesus. And, and so we come to that point, and, and if you're going to identify Jesus as Lord, come on. Jesus is wiser than you, right? I mean, Jesus has better plans for you than you do. So why would we not do what he says? Why do you call me Lord and ignore me? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, I think this is a great and annoying question. Because it is. It, it penetrates to every single one of us. It brings conviction to every single person because there are areas in our lives where we all choose to disobey the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who has changed our lives and made us new. And, and, and by the way, we know Jesus despises fake devotion. Jesus is not a fan of hypocrisy. He doesn't want lip service. We know that because of what he's saying here, but he's also, we know that because of what he said to the Pharisees over and over and over again. Just, we encourage you to read the Gospels here. We encourage you to read the Bible, in case you haven't heard that. And and in it, we see over and over again, Jesus is always challenging the religiosity that didn't accompany works. There was no fruit to the lives of the Pharisees, of the religious leaders, uh, of the scribes, of the people who studied all the time. And and so Jesus is saying, look, if you really love me, obey me. If you're really going to follow me, do what I say. Um, So Jesus deserves an authentic commitment from us. By the way, that's why one of Calvary's core values is transparent living. Transparent living. We want people to be real, open, and honest about who they are and allow others to do the same. Transparent. 
In, in other words, here at Calvary, we don't play religious games because Jesus is not impressed by religious games. It, it doesn't matter what you look like, where you've been, what you've done, how you failed or succeeded. What matters is this. Do you obey Jesus? Uh, in case you're wondering, uh, if you show up at Calvary and you're new and you go, well, I've studied this and I know this and I can teach this, and I do, uh, not impressed. Just not impressed. We don't really care how much you know. We're going to look at your life and see how you live. What do you do? How do you treat people? Do we see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you? That's what matters. Because, and here's the thing, Jesus tells us, right after he asks the question, he tells us, he says, look, if you want to build a successful life, if you want to build a healthy life, if you want to build a life that makes an impact, you have to read and apply God's word. By the, by the way, that's another one of our core values. You hear it every single week. It's called relatable truth. If you read and apply God's word, what will God do? He'll change your life. He will change your life. Why? Because if you apply God's word, you're, you're building your house on a firm foundation. You're building your life on a firm foundation. If you listen to Jesus and obey his teachings, he says you're a wise person and your life is going to stand when trouble comes, when disaster strikes, when, when you know, th there are difficulties and storms that come your way, your life is going to hold up. Why? Because you built your life on God's word. I, I mean, it's that simple. Now, if we play religious games, if we attend church, if we know what the Bible says, if we listen to sermons, if we study the Bible, read the Bible, and we ignore Jesus, in other words, you know what it says, but you don't do what it says. You know the truth, but you don't obey the truth. Jesus says you're like a fool whose life is going to fall apart in the smallest of storms. Now, I don't know about you, I read that, and this is like the simplest, clearest truth about our lives. If you read it and apply it, your life is gonna hold up. If you read it and ignore it, your life's gonna fall apart. If you don't read it and you just ignore it, well, good luck. But, but here's the thing. This is true no matter what life stage you're in. It, this is true whether you are a child who's just starting out a journey following Jesus or whether you are an old codger who's like, I don't have much time left, what's the point? This is true if you, if, if you follow Jesus, if you obey Jesus, the, the more that you do that, the healthier, stronger, and blessed your life is going to be. Just what Jesus said. So let me just confess. I'm a, I'm a blessed man, and I know it. I'm way more blessed than I deserve. I have an incredible, faithful wife uh, that will celebrate 38 years in a couple of weeks. Yeah. I have two beautiful and wonderful daughters. I have five amazing grandkids, and God has blessed me because they all live in Lake Havasu City. And uh, so I am an expert at spoiling. Uh, God has blessed me with great friends, uh, the privilege of pastoring Calvary for 30 years and working with talented staff and volunteers who love Jesus like crazy. And, and here's the thing, all of it is because God's word is true. It's because God's word is true. The best decision I have ever made uh, besides trusting Jesus to be my savior is deciding to, to study God's word and to try and live it the best I could. Bar none, that is the best decision that I made. I was young and stupid, but I was, uh, you know, I was smart enough to do that. And, and so I just want you to know, I'm not blessed because of my education. I'm definitely not blessed because of my talent, brilliance, or good looks. <laughs> I am blessed because I was desperate enough to believe Jesus and try to live out his commands. That's it. That's it, that's the wisdom, that's the, that's the stuff that Jesus teaches us. And, and sometimes we act like this is a children's thing and we make a children's song about it. How many of you know, if you can sing it right now, the wise man built his house on the rock. I'm not gonna ask you to come up and do it, but a lot of you know that one, right? And, and so we, you know, we have motions and stuff and, and we sing that with kids and we say, oh, that's a kid's thing. It's not a kid's thing. This is the simple, you know, purest wisdom that Jesus is giving us. And he's like, if you're gonna call me Lord, do what I say. 
Just do it. And, and your life will stand. Your life will be strong. Now, I'm assuming most of you listening today want to obey Jesus. Maybe not. Okay. So let me, let me rephrase that. Do you desire to obey Jesus? Okay. Well, since you desire to be, obey Jesus, let me share some keys to building a healthy life. Keys to building a healthy life. They, they, look, I, I've been in ministry for over 40 years, and, and so I've talked to enough people that there are some obstacles that are common to almost everyone, and they trip people up, and they get stuck in their spiritual development because these obstacles prevent them from moving forward. If you will, they prevent them or stop them from following Jesus and obeying Jesus and doing what Jesus wants us to do. So uh, I want to talk about them, and if one of them applies to you, I want you to attack it with radical obedience because that's how you change things. If your spiritual life is stuck, you've got to apply radical obedience to it. So if you want to build a healthy life, first of all, be a person of grace. Be a person of grace. In other words, forgive often and always. I know, I don't know what they did to you. I don't know how terribly they hurt you. I don't know how they broke your life and shattered your dreams and wrecked your heart. I don't know that stuff, but here's what I do know. God knows. God is aware, and he still asks you to forgive. You see, Jesus preached forgiveness. He modeled forgiveness, and he told us forgiveness is for you. It's going to bless your life if you will trust him and if you will forgive. So Jesus taught forgiveness. Matthew 5, 7, uh, he said, Blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy. You want mercy? Give mercy. It's that simple. In, in, in Matthew 6, uh, beginning of verse 9, he taught us to pray. He said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I know some of you are trespasses and you're just like, I can't do it that way. <laughs> it applies the same way. Forgive us as we forgive others. Do, do you see that dynamic in our lives? God has given us grace as a, as, as a way to bless our lives. And then, of course, Jesus modeled it. He modeled it with his relationship with his disciples. You know, they all abandoned him. Peter denied him and he restored all of them, used all of them. And, of course, on the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They knew exactly what they were doing, but he gave them grace. So live to forgive. Be a person of grace. Look, that means listen with grace. Most of us listen with judgment. Most of us listen, we hear stuff, and we put the most negative spin possible on what we heard and we start, you know, condemning that person and judging that person and, and heaping scorn on that person. Instead, hear with grace. Decide whatever you're going to listen to, whatever you're going to hear, whatever people say, you're going to listen to it and put the most positive spin possible on it in that moment. Right? That's listening with grace. And then speak with grace. You know, let your words be full of kindness and compassion and encouragement. After all, you do reap what you sow. Might as well get that back. And then just decide you're going to forgive preemptively. When you get up in the morning and go, I'm going to be a person of grace today. I'm going to forgive the next five people that, you know, mess with me. And you, and you might be going, well, why would I want to do that? Because Jesus forgave you. And you sinned a whole lot more against him than anybody's going to sin against you. It, it is that simple. So is grace and forgiveness your obstacle to building a healthy life? Building a healthy life means that you hear and apply Jesus' teachings on grace. And the second obstacle that gets in our way, be a servant. Be a servant. Now this is hard because, I hope I don't offend you, but we're selfish. I mean, when I say we're selfish, I mean I'm selfish and you're selfish, which means you want what you want when you want it. You, you want your stuff to, the way, to happen the way you want it to happen. You want to get what you want. All of that stuff is true. We're all naturally selfish people because we're natural sinners. We don't want to serve others. We want others to serve us. 
And yet Jesus says being a servant is key to a healthy life. Again, if you look at Jesus' entire ministry, his entire life is modeled on being a servant. In Matthew 20, he says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said, my purpose is not for other people to wait on me, it's to take care of other people. And then Jesus taught that serving is the path to greatness. You talk about why do we call him Lord, Lord, and not do what he says. We just ignore him at this point, don't we? Well, I'll take my own path, Jesus. I think I know better than you. Come on, I'm not the only one who's done that, right? We actually, we don't say it out loud, but that's what we say with our lives. Jesus, you're my Lord, and you're wiser than me, but I'm going to do it my way because I want to crash and burn. And yet Jesus says, look, serving is the path to greatness. And then he said, look, if I served you, you ought to serve each other. Yeah, but I'm tired. I don't want to do it. It's so hard. See, and serving blesses us ultimately because it confronts our selfishness. Here's a, the here's a reality. You want your life to fall apart? Live selfishly. Live selfishly because your marriage probably won't last. Your kids probably won't like you. Your grandkids probably won't want to be around you. You'll get everything you want and have nothing because you're selfish. If you serve other people, well, the, the opposite stuff happens. If you decide to serve your spouse, your marriage is gonna get better. You decide to serve your kids, which also means disciplining them and limiting their you know, computer access and all that stuff. But if you decide to serve your kids, your, your, your kids are gonna appreciate you. Serving your grandkids, you know, it involves some spoiling, but it also means having appropriate boundaries and supporting mom and dad and all those things. But be a servant. See, if we deny ourselves what we want in order to bless others, we are, obey we are obeying Jesus at the very core of his commands. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, he must, you guys know the next words? He must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and come follow me. In other words, if you want to follow Jesus, it begins at the point of denying yourself. In other words, saying, hey, I'm selfish and I repent. And, and you know why Jesus wants us to serve besides it's what he did? It's because it helps us to deny ourselves. It helps us. It's practice of I'm choosing to deny myself so I can serve others and, and then God's gonna bless me if I do that. So if you want to build a healthy life, serve not occasionally but habitually look for opportunities to bless don't wait for someone to beg and, and by the way we have serving opportunities like peach springs in a couple of weeks because we want to you know bless other people as a church but in doing that we want to show you what it looks like not so you'll just sign up you know, a couple times a year and go do something really cool and, and help out a community and bless a bunch of kids, but so that that will become your habit in life. So is serving your obstacle to spiritual health? See, if you want to build a healthy life, you've got to be a person of grace who serves, and you've got to be generous. You've got to be generous. Okay, you know this verse. Most of you know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave. gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave. He gave Jesus to be our savior. And we celebrate that. We sing about that. We rejoice in that. We thank God for that. <coughs> but he gave out of love. And, and look, do you realize that Jesus told more parables about generosity and about giving and about money than he did about anything else. You know why? Because he knew this was a huge obstacle in our lives. He knew we got stuck on this in our lives and we wouldn't follow him. We'd like follow him in every other way except uh, not, not money, not money. And see, generosity confronts our greed. Just like we're all naturally selfish, <laughs> I hate to say this, but we're all naturally greedy. I want, oh, I got, I have it, I want more. I mean, that, that's kind of a cycle. Some of you are gonna walk out of here and you're gonna eat, grab an ice cream sandwich and you're gonna be, oh, this is good. I think I'll go out the other way now and get another one. 
You know you will. You'll think that thought, okay? They're cheap enough. Just go to the store and buy a whole box of them and repent of your gluttony later. But <laughs> greed is dangerous to our souls. Okay, Jesus, again, Matthew 6, he says, no one can serve two masters. He will love the one and hate the other. He will cling to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and riches. You can't serve God and money. And if we don't deal with our greed, then it'll take us away from Jesus. It'll be a stumbling block for our lives, and we will crash our lives. So God blesses us by calling us to generosity. He says it again. God blesses you by asking you to be generous. And what that means is tithing. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, look up Malachi 3.10. It's in the Old Testament, uh, last book in the Old Testament. Uh, look, tithing is just giving God 10% of your income. Whatever you make. If you make nothing, guess what? Tithing is zero. If you make a dollar, tithing is 10 cents. It's just proportional. And, tithe, and God commands that so that it's our demonstration of trust in him that God's gonna provide for us. And we recognize him as God, and so we give him 10% of what we make. And then he encourages us to give sacrificially. When we give sacrificially, it relates to God's heart of sacrifice for others. That's why Jesus commended the widow who gave everything she had. He said, hey, she, she only gave a couple of pennies, but she gave more than all these other people because she gave everything. And that means giving more than a tithe. It means giving more than you can afford. People are like, oh, I just can't afford it. Well, really? Because Jesus is asking you to trust him. And, and then generosity just recognizes God as the source of all of our blessings and that you are incapable of outgiving God. And it's a mind shift. It, it just changes the way you think about life, the way you think about resources, the way you think about what you have and how God can use it. And besides, Jesus kind of bluntly put in Luke 6, right before the, the passage of tonight, he said, give and it will be given to you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Uh, you know what I think that is? I think that's Jesus going, do you trust me? Do you really trust me or are you just like paying lip service? Right, do, you, do you really trust me or are you just kind of like saying that you do, but you really trust me with everything but your money? The Apostle Paul echoed Jesus, 2 Corinthians 9. He said, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. So if you want to build a healthy life, listen to Jesus and obey him by being generous. So a healthy life, a strong life, a life that's gonna stand is a life that is a person of grace who serves and is generous. Now, if your life isn't where you want it to be, then are one of these obstacles of application what you're stuck on? Is, is this what's holding you up? Is you identify something tonight? And I shared those three because those are the three most prevalent of the people that I meet with, that I've talked to, that I've listened to, the people have expressed to me, and they just go, oh, I'm kind of stuck here. And, and, and so I shared those because that's, those are the places we gotta begin. All of us gotta begin if we're gonna listen to Jesus. So, uh, so are you stuck? Because some of you are like, I'm two-thirds of the way there. <laughs> Praise God. Some of you are like, well, I'm a third of the way there. Some of you are just like building on sand. You're like enthusiastically, energetically building on sand. And your life's going to crash. And some of you are rejoicing in God's blessings because you heard what Jesus said and you've been trying to obey him for years. You're inhabiting a house built on the rock. Now here's the thing. Jesus asked the question, you decide. Jesus just said, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for patience. Thank you for grace. Thank you for loving us in our mess, and thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit who right now is speaking conviction into our hearts. God, we wanna hear your voice, and we wanna have the courage to yield to you. 
to surrender once again and say, uh, I'm yours, Jesus, and I'm going to obey you. And Lord, it, it doesn't have to be one of these three things. Your, your spirit can speak and point out sins, and any person's life can point out obstacles that I didn't mention. God, just let us hear from you, because we want to be people who are wise. We want to be people who are building healthy lives so that we can declare the greatness of God who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So thank you again for loving us, for calling us, for saving us, and for allowing us to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.